Hello everyone, it's a beautiful day here at the BYU Family History Library and today we'd like to talk about record and source analysis because we really want you all not to be a good clicker, we want you to be a good researcher. In this digital world, it is so easy sometimes to get onto a genealogy website that has hints and we just start clicking on those hints and attaching them to the tree and sometimes we don't really look at what we're clicking on or what we're, what we're attaching to our ancestors. Let's take the example of a user submitted tree on Ancestry. This is Daniel Hildebrandt and let's look at some of his details a little bit closer. According to this user submitted tree, Daniel Hildebrandt was born in New Jersey in 1790 <clears throat> and he had two sons, Henry Hildebrandt who was born in 1805 when Daniel Sr. was 15 years old and Daniel Hildebrandt Jr. was born in 1811. Now this tree did have some sources attached to it so let's look at those. There are four sources attached to this tree. The first is an 1870 census that says Daniel was not born in 1790, but in 1820. That calls into question his ability to father those other two children, doesn't it? Uh, a naturalization index for Scott County, Iowa, that says um, that he naturalized in 1895. Uh, that one is confusing as well, considering he was supposedly born in New Jersey. Here is a Civil War soldier index that said that he served in the cavalry at age 70 something. And finally, a second naturalization index that says he naturalized in Illinois in 1889. So you can see how this, these four sources could not possibly all pertain to the same individual and if they did there w we would need to explain a huge amount of details. So let's look at what we can do to avoid putting ourselves in a situation like this. As good researchers we want to make sure that we're doing it right. We want to make sure that we connect the right parents with the right children and the right grandparents and the right aunts and uncles and stopping and taking the time to look and analyze our records can help us do it right. Elizabeth Schoen Mills, a well-known genealogical researcher, created this research process map to help other researchers um, focus their evidence analysis and we are using this um, image with permission from her. I'd like to quote from what she says about this particular image. She says, sources provide information from which we identify evidence for analysis. A sound conclusion may then be considered proof. And we're going to dive into each one of these very quickly, just a brief overview to give you an idea of how this can help you in your research. We often talk about sources and how important they are and attaching a source to our ancestor on Family Search Family Tree. But what exactly is a source? A source is a container of information. It's something physical that can be read, heard, viewed, things like that. Sources come in two varieties that we're going to speak about today. The first is an original source and the second is a derivative source. An original source are 
things like a marriage certificate, census, photographs, oral history tapes, tax records, journals, monuments, an in-person interview, an email, needlework, digital images, all of those type of things. This marriage record of William Ackers and his bride Althea Ireland is an original record. These are things that we are used to seeing. Another type of record that we're used to seeing but don't always classify it this way are derivative records. And these are records that are created from a prior record by transcribing, abstracting, translating, or sometimes presenting that um, record with alterations. It's a work created to expand the accessibility to the original records, like an index or a finding aid. We saw the original marriage certificate for William Ackers and Althea Ireland. Now here they are listed in the index which makes it a lot easier for us to find them in a record. Sometimes we don't remember that this screen that we often see on Family Search is a derivative record or an index. Whenever we run across an index like this, we should always think, can I find the original? How may I be able to see the image if there's not an image available on this website? Now that we've found a source and we've decided if it's an original or a derivative, the next part is to remember that sources provide information. And there are three different types of information. Primary information, secondary information, and undetermined information. When we start thinking about information, we should ask a couple of questions things like, who gave this information? How do I know it's true? Primary information is information that's recorded near the time of the event and was given, the information was given from eyewitnesses or participants, someone close. It's like getting the information right from the horse's mouth. William Ackers and Althea Ireland would have had to have given information to the court official to create this record and they would have known how old they were and where they were living at the time and so this is a, a case of primary information. Secondary information is information from someone who was not an eyewitness or a participant. Sometimes that information was recorded long after the event. This is a portion of a 1917 death certificate, the portion that the family fills out. And I wanted to show you how secondary information can sometimes be right and sometimes be wrong. This information was given by Ella Amon about her mother and grandparents. Ella said her mother Naomi was born on the 17th of February in 1844 and that Ella's grandparents, Naomi's parents, were Daniel Hildebrandt and Ida Cochran. But Naomi died more than 60 years after Daniel's wife died, after her mother died. So would Ella know the information about her grandparents. She wasn't there at the time, so let's see how she did. Naomi was born on the 17th of February in 1844, and her parents were Daniel Hildebrandt and Eliza Cochran. So you can see that Ella got a lot right, but she did, some things do get muddled over the years. Undetermined information is when we are we can't figure out where the information came from. We can't figure out if it's primary or secondary. 
until the 1940 census, we had no idea who gave the information about the household to the census enumerator. It could have been the husband, it could have been the wife, it could have been one of the older children, it could have been the next door neighbor, it could have been the postman, it could have been the local storekeeper. We just don't know for sure. So let's look at our, our matrix again. Remember that sources provide information and that information becomes evidence. And evidence comes in three different parts three different kinds, direct, indirect, and negative. Direct evidence is information that we find that seems to address the research question on its own with no other help needed. Let's say our research question was what year was Abigail Bacon born? And we found Abigail Bacon in the 1900 census living with her son. And the 1900 census actually lists which year every individual was born. And it says that Abigail Bacon was born in 1797. So that directly answers our research question. Does that mean it's completely right? Maybe, maybe not. We need a little bit more information to make sure, but it directly answers our question without us having to really think about it. Now, indirect information is information that seems to address the answer to a research question only when you combine it with other information, with other sources. This time our research question is, what year was Elias T. Coe born? Now we know that this is the 1870 census and that he was 38 years old at the time. Does that directly tell us what year he was born? Or did you have to do a little bit of math to get there? That's a piece of indirect evidence. And we would probably want to find some more evidence to bolster up our case. Negative evidence does not mean I put my ancestor's name in family search and I didn't find him there. So now I have negative evidence. Now that's not quite what we mean by this and sometimes it takes a while to wrap your head around this one. So you're hot on the trail of one of your ancestors and he has paid taxes every single year in this county from 1823 to 1838 and then suddenly he stops. He never pays taxes in that county again. Well, as you think about it, you realize that there are several different reasons that may be the case. He may have moved away. He may be too old. The county may have an old age clause in its taxes. Or he may have passed away. And so by having him act not appear in the tax records is actually evidence of one of these things, three things happening. And you can use that along with other evidence to bolster your case that one of these three things happened, that he moved away, he was too old, or that he died. Mrs. Mills evidence analysis research map is an amazing tool for us as researchers to slow down and really analyze the records that we're finding, analyze the sources we're finding, make sure that we trust the information that's in them and really find the evidence that we need to prove who our ancestors are. So just remember, don't be a good clicker, be a good researcher and have an awesome day.